There begins videotape number one in the deposition of Linda Carlson in the matter of Kevin Tolson versus St. Agnes Healthcare, Inc. et al. in the Circuit Court for Baltimore City, Maryland, case number 24C120087101. Today's date is February 10, 2014, and the time on the video is 3.18 p.m. This video deposition is taking place at 901 Delaney Valley Road, Towson, Maryland. My name is Paul Cannon, and I am the videographer. The court reporter is Sherry Smith, and we are with Merrill Reporting. Would the attorneys please identify themselves and whom they represent? Rodney M. Gaston, and I represent the plaintiff, Kevin Tolson. Mary Pat McGuire, and I represent the defendants, Caroline Stell, RN, and St. Agnes Healthcare. Inc. On behalf of defendants, Curtis Jackson, MD, Prepper Shell, PA, and Maryland Provo One Medical Services. The court reporter will now swear in the witness. <laughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Could you currently state your name and business address, please? My business address. Okay, it's Linda Carlson. And I work for Good Samaritan Hospital on Lock Raven Boulevard in Baltimore City. Okay. Ms. Carlson, my name is Rodney Gaston, and I represent Kevin Tolson in a medical malpractice case that's pending in the circuit court for Baltimore City. The reason that I've asked you to appear here today at your deposition is because um, defendant St. Agnes Health Healthcare and Caroline Stell have identified you as an expert that may testify in this case. So basically, I'm here to find out the opinions that you intend to give this, in this case and the factual basis for your opinions. But before we begin questioning, have you ever had your deposition taken before? Yes, I have. I'll go over some of the rules real briefly. Um, even though this is being um, videotaped, the court reporter is also here in the room and she's taking down all of my questions and all of your answers. The court reporter can't take down both of us talking at the same time, so I'll simply ask if you could wait until I finish asking my question before you answer, and I'll try to wait until you finish answering your, my question before I ask the next question. Okay. Does that sound fair? Fair. All right. If at any time I ask you a question that you don't understand, please stop me immediately okay. and tell me I don't understand the question, and I'll try to rephrase the question. Otherwise, if you don't let us know that, then I will assume that you've understood the question and you've answered it appropriately. Also. If at any time you need to take a break, just let us know. We'll stop okay, thank you. Your break. All right. Um, Ms. Carlson, I'll show you what's been marked as exhibit number five. Oh, this is my resume. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to okay. ask you. Is that a, a up-to-date copy of yes. your current resume? Yes, it is. Thank you. And do you also have a copy of that in front of you? I do. Thank you very much. All right. Ma'am, I'll show you what's been marked as exhibit number one. And this is the notice of your videotape deposition, which is why we're here today. And it also, there on the second page is a list of documents and items that we ask you to bring with you to the deposition. And I'll ask if you've seen exhibit number one before. Yes, I have. Okay. Now, can you tell me um, which of the items on the second page that you brought with you um, that match the numbers. And number one is, any and all documents in your possession that pertain to the care and treatment of Kevin Tolson. Can you um, just list on the record those items that you have mm. in response to request number one? I have multiple depositions. Okay, taken. can we... And you want me to list those? Yeah, if you could go through the names, if you don't mind. Marion Tolson. Corey Elaine Tolson, I'm trying to put these in some order. Philip Tolson, an affidavit by Philip Tolson. It's Kevin Tolson. I mean, sorry, <laughs> Kevin Tolson, sorry. Robin Laverne Reinhardt. Kenneth Larson. Linda Margison. Um, 
Corrupter Shaw, Prudence Jackson, Kenneth Larson CV, Stacy Anita Tolson, Anita Weiss, Sharon Craddock, Carolyn Steele, Volume 2, and uh, Volume 1 and 2 of Linda Margison. And those are the exhibits to Nurse Margison's deposition. Yeah, these are exhibits to Miss Margison's deposition along with a copy of the Emergency Severity Index. Which is an exhibit number 9 to Margison's deposition. Yes. <coughs> uh, Linda Margison's expert witness report. I said that. I said that one. That's empty. All right. You can identify these things too. All right. This is. I don't know what this is. Circuit That's Court for complaint. Baltimore. The complaint. Okay. Then there's the Centra Medical Record. Then there's Plaintiff Supplemental Answers to Defendants Interrogatories. Copy of the Medical Record. A copy of the. EMS report, um, discharge instructions from the medical record. Oops, sorry. And then the medical record. Obviously. And then the medical record, yes. Starting with 12-3. Going through, I believe, the ER visit of 12-5 and information from it's universe. No, it's not universe. It's all St. Agnes medical record. Okay. Do 12 3 and 12 5. Do you have any medical records from the University of Maryland Hospital? No. Oh, I forgot this. Have you looked at any medical records from the University of Maryland Hospital? Um, I believe I've glanced through them. Um, I don't think so, though. I thought there was excerpts in here. Can you tell from the tabs whether there are or not? For some reason, you can assist let me just take it. Yeah. If you don't mind. No, sure. I just need yeah. to get a list of everything she's looked at and received. I don't believe she has, actually. Um, yeah. The medical record binder does have an index. It's the St. Agnes visit of 12309 and the St. Agnes ER visit of 12509 with the St. Agnes admission thereafter. Um, but I will also tell you that. Um, I didn't ask, nor do I think that um, Nurse Carlson looked at anything other than the ER visit from the third for purposes of her testimony. Okay. Then I have some correspondence between myself and PK regarding, um, one of these is my statement, my report, my certificate of qualified expert, some of the, a copy of the letter of all the different attachments that I received. Um, my bill. Um, close, please find additional records. Copy of a pay stub, check stub. Um, another bill, another bill. Contact information. My rate, of, my rate of what I charge. Based on my conversations. Billing, scheduling of the trial for, got a letter regarding scheduling the trial for May 12th through the 19th, week of the 19th, and make sure that I have some availability to testify. Um, correspondence back and forth that I can do those dates and the dates of the deposition. Um, original letter uh, dated April 8th, 2013, that I have agreed to uh, review the medical records. And then I, there's a letter August 27th saying I received the transcripts of Krupper Shaw, Carolyn Steele, and Prudent Jackson. And then there's something dated, a letter dated the 20th of November, uh, that the trial, it was going to go to trial in February, and I guess that didn't happen. And that's really about it. Okay. Does the manila folder that you have in your hand contain all the correspondence between you and defense counsel in this case? Yes, other than phone calls. 
Right. So, so all the course, none of the, you haven't destroyed any of the correspondence between yourself and defense. No, sir. Right. No, no, sure. And if I could have the middle envelope, ma'am, I'll have the Puerto Marcus okay. as exhibit. I believe we're up to number six. Yeah. I do get that back, right? That's my fault. Yes. yes we'll have to make, we just, a copy. We'll make a copy. Yeah, we'll make okay. a copy and we'll have the original return back to you. Okay. I did bring with me was this only because that's what Miss Marginson, it's the Emergency Severity Index. Her copy was so bad I couldn't read it. She made excerpts, made copies of the out of the book, and I couldn't read the copies. Okay. All that well. What edition do you have? I have the fourth edition, 220 and 220, 2012. Is she it, had an earlier edition. Is there any significant differences between the 2012 edition and the edition at Miss Margins? I uh, just uh, pediatric chapter. Okay. All right. Um, have you reviewed any other documents in preparation for your deposition testimony that are not on this table and not what you just read into the record? I uh, know I haven't. Okay. Uh, we asked you to bring with you any medical text, treatises, articles, reports, experimental data, or other data relied upon by you in support of any opinions you may have in this case. Are there any such medical text, treatises, articles, reports that you intend to rely upon for the opinions you're giving in this case? No, I do not. At this time, do you intend to rely upon any demonstrative evidence, such as medical illustrations, x-rays, things of that nature, for any opinion you intend no. to give in the case? Okay. Did you bring with you any of your uh, 1099 forms, income tax records, that reflect any and all income from forensic legal work, such as testifying in medical malpractice cases? I'm going to object, as I did in my letter to you, after receiving the notice of deposition as to this issue. You can answer. I just got a 1099 on for this case. That's it. Um, and the bill is in there, so in my folder. Right, but um, yeah. what I need to do, I guess, number one, do any of those items exist other than what you brought today from no. other sources, from no. other attorneys that no, have retained you? No, sir. Um, if we were trying to figure out how much money you've earned in the last five years, for testifying in medical malpractice cases and reviewing medical malpractice cases, how would we be able to find that information? I can tell you it's zero. <laughs> zero? Okay. In the last five years. Last five years, zero. Zero. This, this is the first case? No, it's the not the first case. I just haven't done this in a that, long that, time. What I meant was this, yeah. is, this is the first case in the last five years. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's go back to the year that you can remember the last time mm. you served as an expert witness. What year would that be? Oh, gosh. Had to be between over, before 2005. Okay. And can you tell? Can you tell me what is the most amount of money you've ever earned? In oh, I was. Uh, I was wasn't paid. Hang on, hang on Believe it or not, I wasn't paid for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> hang on, I'm second. so sorry. <laughs> Sorry you got stiff. You just did that. Yeah, I got the fun stiff. of it, huh? Now, let me, me re-ask the question, and if you could just wait till I finish. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, you're speaking over each other a little bit, okay. so I'm just going to remind you okay. when you start to do that, because it is hard for the poor court reporter. All right, let's try this again. Can you tell me the maximum amount of money that you ever earned for providing um, legal medical services, such as reviewing medical malpractice cases and providing testimony in medical malpractice cases. Prior to this one? Yes, ma'am. Uh, zero. You've never been paid for wow. any of your legal services? I was an employee at the time. I'm sorry? I was an employee. I was employed by the facility, and I was there legal expert for the deposition for the clinical component relating in the hospital. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about outside of your regular employment as a nurse for a hospital mm -hmm. where you might have reviewed cases for the hospital or act as a quasi risk mm -hmm. manager in a private setting outside of that. Okay. 
is this the only case? Yes, sir. That, hang on a second. Let him finish the question. <laughs> Sorry. You, you, you anticipate, is this the only time <laughs> you've ever reviewed a medical case and reached opinions in a medical malpractice setting? Yes. I'm going to object. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Okay. All right. So I presume there's no transcripts of any transcripts of any depositions for any legal medical malpractice case, correct? Correct. And you've never uh, been, have you ever been qualified as an expert witness before in any court pertaining to a medical malpractice matter? I don't know. I mean in court? Yes, ma'am. Like, like a trial? Yes, ma'am. No, I have not. And do you believe that there is any medical document, textbook, article, or other medical publication that you believe is either reasonably reliable or authoritative in the field of nursing for the nursing issues that are involved in this case? No, I don't believe there is. Okay. And you haven't relied upon any such article or journal for the opinions you're about to give, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Who are you currently employed by? Uh, Good Samaritan Hospital. Okay. And what are your basic duties with uh, Good Samaritan Hospital? I'm the uh, Director of Patient Care Services for the Emergency Department. And can you tell me what a typical 8 or 10 hour day consists of? Hmm. Well, I look at staffing. I look at uh, rounding on patients. Um, having staff meetings. Um, attending meetings throughout the hospital. Um, reviewing records, uh, reviewing um, admissions, reviewing transfers. I review the financial data on a regular basis that comes in and out of the emergency department. Um, putting out fires. Okay. Can you tell me of a regular eight or ten hour day, what percentage of your time is devoted to what I would call administrative acts versus actually in the ER clinical practice, clinical medicine, nursing practice. I'm going to object just to the extent that you, if you don't understand, please ask for I'm not sure exactly what you mean, you know, okay. because I'm out on the unit every day. Uh, that's, that's what I mean. Do you, <clears throat> do you participate in the hands-on triage or assessment of patients in the emergency room? No, not now. And when is the last time that you've done that? Maybe a couple months ago. A couple months ago? With Good Sam? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, is it because your position changed or is it simply because um, that's the way the day breaks down? That's how the day breaks down, pretty much. Okay. All right. So you're not um, assigned to, to work as a triage nurse? No, and, sir. And mm -hmm. you're not assigned to work as a unit nurse? No, in sir. The No, this, that, that entire staff reports to me. Do you plan on giving any opinions in this case that Kevin Tolson was negligent and did or did not do something that caused or contributed to his injuries? No. Can you tell me... Um, do you plan on giving opinions with respect to the triage that was done in this case by any of the employees of St. Agnes Hospital? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me which nurse you're going to comment on with respect to triage and what your opinions are with respect to that nurse or nurses? Well, the, well, the one nurse that was out at triage is uh, Beshi or Craddock, I think her name is now. Okay. I reviewed her record. And what opinions have you reached with respect to the care and treatment Ms. Beshi, now Craddock, performed uh, for Mr. Tolson? Oh, I think she adequately assessed the patient. She got the chief complaint. She took a set of vital signs. She evaluated whether the patient had allergies. She assessed his in, in initial injury. Um, she completed his social history. Um, and signed him an ESI level. 
And what does the standard of care in Maryland require of a nurse who performs a triage in an emergency room setting for a patient such as Mr. Tolson? I'm going to object to the scope of the question. It seems very broad, but if you know, you can answer. I don't know what the standard of care is, but every patient that comes into the emergency department would get an assessment of his chief complaint. There's an subjective and an objective component to that, what the patient tells you and what you observe. Okay, so you've never given an opinion before with respect to the standard of care, is that correct? Objection. Well, I mean, I, I'm in a position where I, I evaluate that daily. No, well, did you just say that you do not know what the standard of care is for a patient such as Mr. Tolson who reports to the emergency room for injuries? Well, I, I didn't say I didn't know the standard of care. What I said is I, I, I know Mr. Tolson should be evaluated for his chief complaint. What is he your should be assessed by the nurse, which he was. And what is your understanding of the standard of care in the medical legal community? To do what any uh, other reasonable nurse would do, faced with the same patient, same situation. And does that standard, is that standard of care different whether a patient is an emergency room here in uh, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Virginia, New York, or any other emergency room? Across well, the United States? It's individualized to the patient, so you can't have one standard that fits all. I mean, you know, you, you know, the patient presents and you evaluate what he presents with, and every patient's different. Maybe we're talking about the same thing. Okay. I'm talking about a patient with the same complaints, whether they present in an ER here in Maryland or Virginia, New York, California. Would the standard of care be the same for that patient? Would the assessment be the same? The standard of care with respect to the triage assessment and respect to the focused nursing assessment? It would be similar, yes. Okay. Do you see any significant differences throughout the United States? It would depend on what information you're able to get from the patient and what you assess with. Um, but what I'm saying is assuming that you get the same information okay. with, the, with, the, with the triage and the focus assessment be pretty much the same. So you're saying if the patient came in with the same complaint, I hurt my left leg at work, okay. right. would I do the same type of an assessment? That we, yes, I would, I would definitely do the same type of assessment. Okay. And that assessment should be the same whether you're in Maryland or New York or California? Correct. Okay. All right. Now, uh, so you said the triage assessment has to be evaluation of the chief complaint. Mm -hmm. Is that the first thing? That's normally the first thing you do is you ABC, airway, breathing, circulation, check for deficits, and then evaluate. Does part of that usually involve a question to the patient, how'd you get injured? It would, but, but, you're, but what you're doing is you're talking to the patient and you're introducing yourself. What brings you here today, Mr. Tolson? Uh, if the patient's able to verbalize, details of that evaluation of, the, of that information there but triage is a very usually patients that commit triage they're usually in some type of pain okay with a leg injury um then you would check the neurovascular status of the patient you would document whether he was awake alert and oriented you would do a pain scale you would evaluate his current medical history whether he's on any meds at home whether he has any allergies you do uh, vital signs and a weight. With respect to the question of what brings you here today, does it also involve a question, how were you hurt, how were you injured? Objection. Well, it's you asking mechanism of injury. Well, what I'm asking is when, <laughs> if, <laughs> let's say tomorrow you end up as a triage nurse in Good Sam. Mm -hmm. Somebody calls out sick, you got to serve as a triage nurse. A patient comes in with similar type of injuries, mm -hmm. Mr. Tolson. Would one of the questions you've asked him, in addition to what brings you here is, mm -hmm. can you tell me how you were hurt? Would that be a question that a triage nurse would normally ask of a patient? Objection, foundation. You can I would normally ask the patient to tell me what brought him here today and have him it'll explain that whole process of what brought him here today. And if in the explanation he did not describe how he was hurt, would then you follow up with the question such as, 
How were you hurt? How were you injured? Objection. I would probably um, begin my assessment of the patient at that point. Is it important for you as a triage nurse to know how a patient became injured if he's able to tell you that? No objection to the use of the form of the word important. I think that carries different meanings for different people. Well, the patient's awake, alert, and oriented and talking to you. So, I mean, he can explain. Usually when you ask them what brings you here today, they normally explain what brought them there. And again, is it important for you to know if the patient doesn't tell you how he or she was injured to then ask them, how'd you injure your leg? Well, I think he said that. I heard it at work. But the yeah. question is, if the patient doesn't volunteer that information when you ask him the initial question, what mm -hmm. brought you here today, would you then, as a triage nurse, ask the patient, how'd you hurt your leg? How did you become? It's not necessary that happened in triage. That can happen in the next assessment or by the provider. Uh, how come it's not necessary in triage? Because the to triage. Learn, to, hang on a second. Okay. The to learn how the patient was injured. Because you're there to sort. Okay, triage is a French word for sort. You're strictly there to see at what level and how quickly that patient needs to be seen by a provider. Okay, so you're there to sort patients into the five categories that most of us use now across the country uh, in order to categorize where that patient needs to go. The main thing is that you've got the entire waiting room. So you've got to be able to sort patients that are there for chest pain, renal pain, who, who look, oh God, awful, who may be a level two and need to go into the back immediately. Okay, so the triage nurse's job is to sort the patients. She doesn't get into a lot of in-depth at that point. So it's not important for you to learn how the patient became injured as, as part of a triage assessment, is that correct? Again, I'm going to object. You've asked the question several times over my objection without clarifying by what you mean important, not clarifying that you're asking mechanism of injury questions and trying to style it in a different way, and the witness has answered you several times. So I think we should move on. Ma'am, did you understand my question? Well, you can repeat it. Do you think it's important or not? for a triage nurse assessing a patient such as Mr. Tulsa to ask him and to find out how he was injured. Objection for the same reason. You can answer. I don't believe it's that important to triage, especially if he's awake, alert, and oriented and talking to me. What, are the, what is the information that you attempt to get from a patient at triage in the emergency room? Asked and answered. Go ahead. His chief complaint. Does that mean what hurts you? Correct. Okay. Does the triage assessment involve a physical assessment? Of the, of the patient? It would involve assessing the patient's injury. You would not be able to do a full physical assessment in triage. For a patient as Mr. Tolson, would it require touching his leg? Yes. Okay. And why would a, a triage nurse touch his leg? To um, evaluate um, his pain and um, his circulation, pulses. Would it, would it be to try to determine the location of any injuries on his leg? Objection. Normally you have the patient tell you where, do you, where does your leg hurt? I mean, this gentleman, I understand, came in with, a, with his leg splinted, fully dressed. Does the triage assessment include noting any deformities on the patient's body? If visible. Does it require the triage nurse to uh, write the nature and character of the deformity? If it's visible. For a patient such as Mr. Tolson, does it require, I think, uh, does it require the evaluation of his pulses in his leg? Yes. How does a triage nurse evaluate a patient's pulse in their leg? 
Well, you would value Under the situation that we have here with Mr. Tolson. No, just to, how do you evaluate pulses in a patient's leg at triage? You would uh, check your pulses below the uh, injury, depending on where the injury is. Would you check pulses at the site of the injury? If it's accessible. And what was your understanding of the accessibility of Mr. of the pulses that could be checked in Mr. Tolson's leg when he arrived at the emergency room? My understanding is his leg was splinted, and only the lower distal pulses were, were uh, palpated. Do you know the type of splint he was wearing? No, I do not. Would you have to know that in order to determine whether there was an ability to check the popliteal pulse? No, not necessarily. Why not? Because uh, the medics use different various splints, um, and then they normally, when they do splint, um, and this is just from my practice, is usually it's bilaterally on both legs and it's wrapped. Um, but in this case, I don't know what he had on. Okay, so in this case, we don't, we just don't know whether or not there was an ability to check the popliteal artery pulse because we simply don't know the exact type of brace that was put on his leg, would that be a fair statement? Objection to foundation, there's never been testimony that that's even required by the standard of care. So you're Obje misleading please the don't, patient. Please don't tell the witness what is required by the standard of care. I did if you're gonna, Yes, yes, you just did. So I said you haven't that, laid gonna, a foundation. If we're going to do that, we're going to ask the witness to leave. Now, I want to ask the court reporter to read back my last question to the witness. So in this case, we, did, we just don't know whether or not there was an ability to check the pup, the teal artery pulse, because simply don't know the exact type of brace that was put on his leg. Would that be a fair way to say? I'm renewing my objection. You have not established foundation for that question. Ma'am, you can answer. Normally, the nurses just check distal pulses initially, distal to the injury. I think you said if, it, if the pulses were available to be checked at the injury site, they would do that as well, correct? No, objection misstates the testimony. I don't know what kind of splint he had on and whether any of that was visible or accessible. Where is your understanding of the location of the injury to his leg upon triage? I heard it was the knee, left okay. leg, knee. <clears throat> if the triage nurse was able to access Mr. Tolson's popliteal artery, would the triage nurse would be required to check the pulses at the popliteal artery? She could do ephemeral, which is above that area, and then do a pedal pulse. I'm, I'm asking you just to listen to the question. Okay. okay. If the triage nurse was able to gain access to the back of his knee where the popliteal artery is, would she be required to assess the popliteal pulse? She wouldn't be required to. I mean, there's no requirement for that. Standard of care doesn't require that. Standard of care? I mean, the nurse d did an assessment of the, of the, uh, the extremity with positive piece of pedal pulses. She went up and down the leg at some point. We're talking, are we still talking triage? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So she checked both pedal pulses. He's got his leg in a splint. He's fully clothed. It would be very difficult for her to feel a pedal pulse or a popliteal pulse at that point with him being fully clothed. Right. If it was accessible, is she required to do it or not? Objection. At the popliteal artery level. Asked and answered. Can you ask it again, Rodney? I'm sorry. Ask it differently because I'm not sure what you're asking me. Okay. For Mr. Tolson's case, uh -huh. if the triage nurse was able to reach behind his knee uh -huh. and palpate the popliteal artery, the pulse there, is that something she should have done? Objection. It depends on how painful it would be for the patient because you have to bend the leg to do that. You can't take it in a straight leg position because you may not be able to feel it. You have to bend the knee a little bit and feel behind. So that would be something that she would have to, in her clinical judgment, make a decision on whether that's something she felt was safe for the patient at that time. If it was, would that be something that she should do? She Objection. could. Objection. Okay. Now, um, is a palpation of a pulse reliable? As to what? For determining 
the amount of flow into the patient's leg or a decrease of the flow of blood into a patient's leg? Objection that goes beyond the scope of this witness's testimony. Pulses are pulses. It doesn't tell you how the blood flow is. Okay. Right. Now, so, um, and what is the evaluation that the triage nurse gave to the pulse in Mr. Tolson's ankle? I believe she wrote positive pedal pulses. Do you know whether that's a one, two, three, or four on the scale? No. Could it have been a one or a two? Two's considered normal. Um, is there any way of knowing whether it was normal or abnormal from the chart? I will tell you from, from practice and from what I see, if it's weak, they indicate weak. If it's bounding, they'll indicate bounding. Is there any way to tell from the chart whether the pulse was one, two, three, or four? No, but pulses are positive. Okay. Yeah. Um, do we know from the chart where the deformity was on Mr. Tolson's leg? It just says positive for deformity. Would it be fair to say that the nurse who did the triage at least appreciated a deformity? Say that again, I'm sorry. Would it be fair to say that the triage nurse at least appreciated that there was a deformity somewhere on Mr. Tolson's leg when she did the triage? I'm going to just he keep the records open. So yeah, let me look at that again. Once you're asking, answering questions without having your records. It might be in here. Uh, yeah, that's set. There. Set it set. There you go. Yeah. So what's your question now that we're looking at the record? Would it be fair to say that the triage nurse who performed the triage assessment on Mr. Tolson on December the 3rd, 2009, at least appreciated there was a deformity somewhere along his left leg? Yes, I think she explained that. Left leg trauma, deformity, unable to move his foot, yeah. positive for fetal pulse. Location she if, has down left leg for pain. But I'm going to go back to the deformity. If she appreciated there was a deformity, would you expect for her to write the location <coughs> of the deformity, whether it's on the knee, whether it's on the calf, whether it's on the ankle, whether it's on the thigh? Okay, again, Rodney, I'm going to have to make several objections here. You continually okay, we can use let, let, broad you know, you language. Need, you need to step That's outside. Fine. You need to take your mic yeah, off. Go ahead and step outside for a moment. Oh, okay. So you don't distract yourself. Okay. okay. There you go. I'm objecting to all these questions where you use words like, is it important to? Would a nurse do this? Would it might be something somebody did? Is it something that you might see happen? Is it something you might expect somebody to happen? None of those questions are applicable. The applicable question is whether or not it's the standard of care or a breach in the standard of care, not whether or not something's important. None of those words or terms mean the same thing to you as they may to Ms. Carlson. So you're unfairly posing your questions to her, probably because this is her first time de being deposed in this context. And I think that that's just um, unfair to her. So I'm asking you, since you're going to try to twist the meaning of your words expected or important into standard of care testimony, that you be fair to the witness and ask her in the appropriate way. I disagree, and I'll ask the questions in the manner in which I want to, and you can put your objection and on. Then I'm going to continue to object. You can. Let the witness come back in, please. Court report is going to be re read back the last question, Ms. Carlson. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the deformity. If she appreciated there was a deformity, would you expect for her to write the location of the deformity, whether it's on the knee, whether it's on the calf, or whether it's on the ankle, whether it's on the thigh? 
again, I'm objecting. You haven't phrased the question in terms of standard of care. Your generalized statements of what's expected and, and what's you, excuse important. Excuse me, you cannot put a speaking objection on the record. That's exactly why we had this witness leave. I Please told, don't do that again. Well, that's the ground of my objection. You have not used proper terminology and it lacks foundation the way you're phrasing the questions. Yeah, now I'm joining the objection. Okay, ma'am. You can answer the question now. You're going to have to say it again. I'm going to repeat it again, of course. Go ahead, Madam Court Reporter. Read it back again, please. And we're talking triage, right? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to go back to the deformity. If she appreciated there was a deformity, would you expect for her to write the location of the deformity, whether it's on the knee, whether it's on the calf, or whether it's on the ankle, whether it's on the thigh? Objection, form, and foundation. I don't believe it's necessary in, in triage. Why isn't it necessary in triage? Because if you got the hand second. Okay, I'll wait. If a triage nurse visualizes a deformity mm -hmm. on the patient's leg mm -hmm. to note the location of the deformity, the size of the deformity, and the character of the deformity. Okay. Because she's doing a triage assessment. She's looking at evaluating the patient on his chief complaint in order to establish an acuity on how the patient needs to be placed in the emergency department. This is not a full physical assessment. The patient's still clothed. So, I mean, he could have had swelling under that knee that you can't really see what it looks like. I mean, you don't know until you take his clothes off and take the splint off whether he's got abrasions, contusions, bruising. Can you answer? Yeah. Does the presence of the deformity affect the number of interventions that may be necessary for a patient such as Mr. Tolson? You're talking resources. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Based on ESI? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, in, in triage, you're always looking at resources needed. Okay. He definitely needs an x-ray. Any type of radiology procedure he would require, uh, that would be one resource. There's no way to pre predict on presentation what the workload will be later as far as his needs. Okay. Now, we, let, I want to move on to the um, second handwritten note where it says, unable to move the left foot. Okay. Okay. Is there any way to know the reason why Mr. Tolson is unable to move his left foot from that notation? No, there isn't. Okay. For a patient such as Mr. Tolson, who has a deformity somewhere on his leg, mm -hmm. and unable to move his left foot, does that suggest a possible neurovascular injury? No, it does not. Why not? Because that could, be from, that, uh, that could be from pain alone. And, and could it be from an injury to a nerve? Objection. Objection. I don't know. Well, what are the possible causes of a, Mr. Tolson's being unable to move his left foot? I'm going to object to the scope of that question for this witness. You are now asking for medical diagnostics, and this is a, a nurse here talking about the nursing standard of care. Yeah, now, same objection. So, what or something possible or not is not relevant. Go ahead. You said pain might be one of the reasons. And swelling. Well, swelling. Let, let's get a question out before anybody okay. is answering. Okay. Pain, swelling, could an injury to a nerve also result in a patient being unable to move his left foot. Again, it is irrelevant possibilities, just like Ms. Dinsmore just stated, so I object. Hi, Joyce. Nursing doesn't usually assess for nerve injury. We do neurovascular assessments. And what is a neurovascular assessment? Is that an assessment of nerves and vascular well, it, supply? It's a combination of feeling the patient, skin, feeling that he has sensation, feeling the temperature of his skin, feeling the warmth or coldness of his skin, feeling his pulse. When you feel for sensation, are you, are you generally checking to see if his nerves are intact, whether he has uh, peripheral? No. Okay, what, what are you feeling for if you're feeling, if you're feeling for sensation? Then he can feel your hands. A hand touching mm -hmm. a, a limb. That's exactly right. Okay. That's simple. And is that 
And if it, I'm just trying to figure out, if you want to know if the patient can feel you touching his limb, isn't that to see whether or not he has feeling in that part of his body? Objection. I'm not sure I follow you. Okay. Well, you said you're feeling for sensation. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it have to do with nerves? Objection. You're, you're trying to make this witness into a medical no, doctor, no, and no. she's already testified again no, no. that that's not fair. She's already answered this question. So, Mr. Gaston, I'm sorry you want to continually go back to re-ask questions because you're not happy with the answer you got, but it's just not fair for you to continually berate these witnesses with insufficient questions, with inarticulate wording in your questions to see if they'll change their testimony. I'm not trying to do that. Now, ma'am, what I'm trying to figure out is if you're feeling for sensation, mm -hmm. what, are, what physiological function are you checking for? Objection. Ms. Go ahead. Ms. Carlson, let me just advise you of something. Okay. You are here as a nursing expert Correct. witness. Jack, you can't give her advice during I, the middle of a question. That's I exactly am, what you're trying to do. You can't do that. Let me explain to you, Ms. Carlson. You are here as a nursing expert witness. You are here and are certainly able to answer all of Mr. Gaston's questions that deal with nursing assessment or with nursing performing a neurovascular assessment. Mm -hmm. You are not required to speculate. You are not required to answer medical, physician-based questions. I know you've already said this to Mr. Gaston, but if he, conti if he continues to ask you questions seeking that sort of information, that which is medically based, based on what a physician would do, based on pathophysiology, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, then you simply need to tell him where the scope of your opinions lie. Okay. I just want to ask you your opinions in the field of nursing and nothing else. So let's go back to the nursing assessment for triage. Mm -hmm. When you touch a person's leg, mm -hmm. you want to see if they can feel your hands touching the leg, correct? Correct. Is that a test to see if they have nerve functions? No. It, no. Okay. What it's is it not. a test for? If it's not test, testing for nerve functions, what are you testing for when you're seeing whether or not a patient can feel you touching their leg? You're testing the CVS sensation. That's it. I'm sorry, you say <laughs> sensation. C That's all you're testing for on whether he's got sensation and he can feel in that lower extremity. Okay. Right. Now, in this case, was that assessment done by the triage nurse? I do not see that documented. Was that supposed to be done by the triage nurse? I mean, she may have done it, but I don't see it documented. Was she supposed to have done it? Objection. Does the standard of care require her to have done that test? Most nurses will all do, will, will touch the patient, feel the skin, check the pulses. It's pretty common practice. I think you said part of a nursing triage assessment is to feel for sensation. Well, that's what you're doing. You're touching right. them. You can feel sensation when you check pulses, too. And you've testified in this case that there's no evidence from the chart. There's no the documentation in the chart that says she did that. Exactly. The standard of care required her to do that, correct? Objection. I'm not aware of that. I thought it you said... It requires you to document. Wait a minute. I thought you said, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that part, the standard of care for a triage assessment requires you to feel the patient's limb for sensation, correct? It's part of the neurovascular assessment, yes. Yeah. We have no evidence in the medical chart that that was done, correct? Well, you, Objection, go ahead. You do because she felt for pulses. You can't feel for pulses without touching the skin. And you can do all of that at the same time. I can feel that patient's temperature, his sensation, and his pulses all at the same time. All I have to do is ask him. But a patient can have a positive pedal pulse and his ankle still be numb to the touch, correct? Objection. You'd have to ask a physician that. I don't know. Pain was on a scale of 1 to 10. It was 7 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Is that qualify as severe pain under the ESI guidelines? Yeah, it, it basically hits the severe, medium to severe scale. Does a, a severe scale of pain require a resource? 
Unless you, it, it would if you anticipate IV medication. Was that a reasonable anticipation in this case? Objection. I will tell you that most patients with this would not get IV medication right away. Most? Yeah. But some would? Some would. It's a physician decision on whether he feels the patient warrants IV medication, IM medication, or PO medication. That's something the doc orders. Did the standard of care require the nurse that did the triage to write the date of the triage in the report? I'm sorry, what did you say, the date? Yeah. No. The time of the triage? No, I mean. Patient's age? It's on there, it's on his office, on his label. Did the standard of care require them to write the patient's age in the box that's indicated <laughs> on the No, shift. that's not a care issue, that's a documentation issue. Yeah. Okay. A lot of care is delivered that isn't documented on patients, care and, and comfort. And, and do you know how much time it took for the nurse to perform the triage? I do not. Does it matter? No. Okay. Yeah. And what is the appropriate level for triage based upon the assessment that was performed by Nurse Beshi Craddock in this case? I'll check to the form. You can answer. His vital signs are stable. He's awake, alert, and oriented. He definitely needs an x-ray. May need a medication for his pain. Could be PO. I'd either categorize him as a four or a three, or a low three. They do low threes now. And according to your understanding of how St. Agnes Hospital works, would a categorization of a three send him to the main ER versus the urgent care? Objection. I don't know. You don't know? Now, are those all the opinions that you have with respect to the triage assessment performed by Nurse Beth G. Craddock? I can tell you I'm going to ask more questions, but we can do that at the end of the deposition. Okay. As far as you know, from your memory. Well, I think she expedited this care. I think she did a very good assessment. I think she hit the highlights of what he needed to have. She indicated he had pain, he had pedal pulses, he had a deformity. His vital signs were stable, he was awake and alert, she took a medical history, put his weight down in case he needed medication. Uh, his arrival's here by stretcher, he's got a splint on. I, I, I don't see anything wrong with her, her triage assessment at all. Okay. Now, um, do you know the name of the next nurse who performed an assessment on Mr. Paulson? Are you asking her to give a specific sequence of nurses that were involved in his care, or are you asking who the nurse was who took care of him in urgent care? The next nurse that assessed him, if you know. Because I assume you're going to testify regarding her standard of care. I just need to know if you know the next nurse. He's going to, she's going to testify about any nurse who you, have, you were intending to criticize. I don't think it's relevant whether it's the next nurse in time or sequence. Why don't you ask her questions if she has any questions regarding Nurse Stell or if she has any questions regarding Nurse, uh, opinions regarding Nurse Weiss, if that's what you want to do. Okay. Because they were both involved also, you know. Right. The sequence of events is who gave what and one gave pain med, one ordered an x-ray, I mean. Okay. Pick which one you want to talk about first. <laughs> Anita Weiss. Anita Weiss. Okay. Uh, what was Miss Weiss required was she required to do a focused assessment for Mr. Tolson? Unless it was different from the triage assessment, she was not required to do one. And how would you know if it was different? Would she be required to do an assessment or not? I'm going to object. None of this is an issue in the case. You excuse me. Excuse, you can't no, do speaking I'm, objections. Okay, She's well, then leave. I'm going to instruct you, Ms. Carlson, that Mr. Tolson, that Mr. Gaston is asking you questions regarding focused assessment by Anita Weiss, RN. Anita Weiss, RN, is not in any way criticized in this case regarding okay. her assessment of Mr. Tolson. So you do not need to answer questions regarding her assessment skills. That is not an issue in this case. It is up to you if you choose to. Okay. But Mr. Gaston is again trying to make something out of a case where he has no testimony and Object no evidence, nor even a claim in his complaint to support the questions that he is now asking you. Okay. Ma'am, 
was Miss uh, was Nurse Weiss required to do an assessment of Mr. Tolson or not? It's a simple question. No. Okay. Why not? Because I don't know what her role was other than giving medication. Okay. Now. Can a nurse give medication to a patient without having an order from a doctor? No. Okay. In this case, is there any evidence in the medical chart that there was a verbal order for the administration of the lauded? Go through the record, ma'am. Take your time. There is an order for the lauded under the medication order. That would be a written order. Correct? Dilaudid, one milligram IV. That would be a written order, correct? That is a written order. Okay. Is there any evidence in the chart of a verbal order that was given for the administration of Dilaudid? Objection. To this, for the same reasons, this is not an issue in the case, and it is not relevant to the case. There's no testimony that Dilaudid was... Please don't do the speaking of I have to. No, you don't. Rodney, the witness I do. has to leave. There is no evidence in this case, no, nor an allegation in this case, that this medication was given without a proper order. Therefore, again, Ms. Carlson, it is up to you. You do not need to answer this question. I would advise that you don't answer this question, but that is your choice. Ma'am, you can't give the witness instruction not to answer I didn't instruct her not you to did. answer. You did. You said I you'd, would advise her not to answer. That's the same thing, and you can't do that. You can't misquote me either, Mr. Gaston. I advise the witness that I don't think she needs to answer this question, but that it's her choice. The same thing. Well, okay. the lot of order is written. Okay. So can we agree that there's no verbal order in the chart given by a physician assistant or a doctor for the administration of the lot? I'm going to again object. It's the same basis for my objection, Ms. Carlson. You do not need to answer that question. It's up to you. Okay. I don't know if there is or isn't a you verbal order given. You don't know if there is or isn't? I mean, I can only go by what's written here. Okay. All right. Now... Do you know whether or not the focused assessment that was performed by Nurse Stell was performed before or after Mr. Tolson was given the injection of the lauded? I don't know. Does it make a difference to you in the opinions that you're about to give in this case? No. Okay. Now, is it your understanding that Nurse Stell performed the focus assessment of Mr. Tolson? I believe that's what she testified to in okay. her uh, deposition. Can, can you tell me for Ms. Stell, who performed, mm -hmm. said she performed a focus assessment, what the standard of care required of her for this focused assessment for Mr. Tolson? She would reassess his initial injury from triage. <coughs> Was she required to do anything more in a focused assessment than the triage nurse did for the triage assessment? She required to do more? Right. Well, she would be required to uh, uh, assess the patient. I mean, if the splint's off and the clothes are off, I mean, but I don't know when that happened, so I couldn't tell you how. He's detail. asking you what she's required to do with her, with her initial assessment. Okay. He's not asking you specifics about splinting. Just listen okay. to what his questions are. Okay. You want to repeat that again? <laughs> I just want to know in your opinion <laughs> what, Ms. Stell was, what Nurse Stell was required to do for her focused assessment of Mr. Tolson. Any nurse that has a patient with a leg injury is going to use her clinical judgment and her expertise in how to assess that injury. I would assume that she would assess that above and below the injury, that she would feel the patient's leg. She would go above probably if it's the knee, she would start above the knee, palpate, work her way down. Check pulses as you go. Notice any type of deformity or discoloration. And talk to the patient while you're doing it. And see if he's got pain. And would her assessment be different 
whether the splint was on or off Mr. Tolson's leg at the time she did the assessment. Her assessment might be different if he was in pain. Because you know, sometimes patients can't tolerate you assessing them when they're in acute pain. Sometimes you have to give the pain medication a chance to work in order to do an assessment. Did Ms. Stell indicate that her assessment was affected by Mr. Tolson's level of pain or not? I don't recall in her testimony if she did. Okay. If it wasn't affected by, her, by Mr. Tolson's level of pain and the splint was off his leg, can you go through in detail what you mean by checking above the leg, above the knee, below the knee, exactly physically what was she supposed to do under the standard of care for her assessment of Mr. Tolson? Do you understand the question? I would touch him. I would start at the top of the leg. I would palpate down and tell him to let me know if, you, if I hit a spot that hurts. Let's take a look at this. You know, I would go all the way down the leg. the standard of care. Yeah. Okay. And the nurse would go all the way down the leg into the into the into the foot. Okay. You know, and check pulses as you go if you're able to get them. But we would not manipulate the leg in any way. We'd not bend the leg in any way. Uh, if it became painful, you would stop, notify the provider, because then he would have to do a, fir a th probably he would have to do his exam whether it hurt or not. We don't do that. We don't hurt patients during exams. Okay. We're gentle. So it would not require putting Mr. Tolson's leg through any range of motion testing? No. Oh, no, 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 no. Would it require checking his leg for temperature? Well, as you touch it you would be able to feel the temperature. And is this assessment that's done by Ms. Stell supposed to be recorded somewhere in the chart? Objection to the form. You can answer. It's not required you write it down. Only the abnormals, because I believe they chart by exception. So for anything that she found abnormal in her assessment, would she be required to note that in the chart? Objection. Abnormal from the triage assessment. I would expect so, but I don't believe she did. So, we don't, is it your understanding that Miss Nurse Stell did not write anything in the chart following her focused assessment of Mr. Tolson? My understanding is she made this X in the chart indicating that she uh, found no difference from normal. Are you familiar? From his original assessment in triage. Are you familiar with page six? In, your, pra sure. in your practice, have you ever seen the form page six? And what is your page six? Ma'am, I'm going I'm to hand you exhibit number two. Oh, this is the and discharge? That, no, ma'am. You take a look <laughs> oh, at exhibit number oh. two. I'm going to go to page six. Okay. Is that the page where you said she wrote that in like X in the chart? No. Okay. What's page six then? I'm looking at that form that has assessments boxes in it. Okay. He's okay. talking just so just so you know, Ms. Yeah. Carlson. I know he didn't explain this to you. This is plaintiff's. Um, he put this together as Exhibit Two, and it's his collection of medical records, although okay. I don't know that it's complete because I haven't looked all through it. Okay. When he's talking about page six, he has numbers stamped here at the bottom okay. right. Okay. And so his numbers may not be the exact same okay. as your numbers because we all put our records together a little bit differently. All okay? right. So when he's asking what page, if this page mm -hmm. six is that sheet, mm -hmm. he's referring okay. to this one. Okay. okay? And, and just so you know where these records came from, these are the records that the defendant <coughs> provided to us. Mm -hmm. And this is what they gave us. Mm -hmm. and, so and, let's go and to also, page let me six. just also tell you, can I have to look at this now? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure this is incomplete, as all the other ones have been, and not everything that I have produced to plaintiff's counsel. But, but let me just double check that so I can be sure.
Yeah, this is incomplete. This is less than what I have produced to Mr. Gaston. However, for purposes of his questions, I think you can answer these. Okay. Unless he goes to something that I have produced that he's not. So you're talking about this one? I am. Page six. I am. And what was the question again? The question was, in your years of nursing practice, have you seen forms similar to that of Pate's on page uh, six? six? Objection relevance. You can answer. Well, everybody has a medical record and everybody's got forms for documenting assessments and I've not seen that specific form but there are assessment forms for nursing documentation tools for nursing do you know whether or not St. Agnes Hospital uh, required Nurse Stell to fill out this form as part of her assessment no I don't did know. it matter does, does the opinions that you give in this case matter whether or not the hospital required her to use the form or not no it doesn't matter and is this a form that a nurse who's doing a focused assessment can use if she wants to? If St. Agnes says so. Madam, there's a question. Okay. What was your question? Is this a form that Nurse Stell could have used if she wanted to, to make notations of her focused assessment for Mr. Tolson? I don't know what else she has available to her. What other forms? St. Agnes provides, so I don't, want, I don't want to really answer that because I don't know what she has choices to use and not use. Did you understand that she had a choice to fill out page number six if she wanted to? Well, she did. She put an X on it. So she had the opportunity to use the form, but she elected not to use the form. Is that your oh, understanding? Objection. There is, again, you are misrepresenting her testimony and yeah. turning this around yeah. on purpose. Ms. Ms. I just need to ask you a simple question. Ms. Carlson, did you read Nurse Stell's deposition? I testimony? did, but I don't remember it from no. verbatim. But my understanding, Mr. Gaston, is she put an X through this, ver verifying the fact that she found nothing abnormal in the patient's physical assessment than what was originally discovered at triage. Right. So this is a form yes. that she had in the chart that Correct. If, she, if she wanted to fill out every box on the form, the chart was available there for her to use. Would that be it's a her fair prerogative statement? if she wants to, I guess? Right, I mean, I don't think it's required because most places chart by exception. You only chart abnormals. Okay. And by charting with exception, mm -hmm. it's only the abnormal findings that she found as a result of her focus assessment that are different from the triage nurse's findings? I'm sorry? You didn't finish the question, I don't think. Okay. Charting by obsec uh, uh, exception means okay. that for the abnormal findings that she found from a focused assessment of Mr. Tolson, the only one she's required to note on the chart would be those that are different from the triage nurse's assessment? That would be my interpretation of charting by exception, yes. Okay. And is that... And do you chart by exception, uh, exception in your hospital? Uh, as of April, we are computerized, so we don't do paper charting anymore. Okay. And there are some hard stops, but most of it, there's a few hard... Okay. Well, you didn't... Yeah. On the computer chart, do you chart by exception or not? Objection. You? Irrelevant. It After is irrelevant. the fact, and what happens yeah. in her hospital is, has yeah. nothing to do with what's going on in this case. Are, are your opinions based upon your training, <coughs> education, and experience as a nurse? Yes. Okay. Is it based upon what hospitals currently do or don't do? Objection. You know what I'm talking about, Rodney. You can't ask her about specific documentation forms that she uses in her hospital in April of 2013 and somehow use that to bolster some sort of other testimony regarding what happened at a different hospital using a different type of charting in 2009. That's my point. Now you're done. I think so. Good. <laughs> Ma'am, is your opinions that you're going to give here today based upon the training expertise that you've had in the field of nursing that was in place in December of 2009? I think it'll be a, a combination of all my years of nursing. Okay. Do you know whether at St. Agnes Hospital the nurses are allowed to chart by exception or, exception or not? I was told they could. Okay. And who were you told that by? Um, I believe it was in the depositions. Okay. 
Do you know what the hospital policy on charting by exception is? I don't know their policy. Foundation. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we take a quick break? I'm sorry. I need to run to the ladies' room. Sure. That's a good idea. 4.27 p.m. going off the record. 4.36 p.m. back on the record. Ma'am, if when Nurse Dell assessed Mr. Tolson's leg, when she got down to his ankle, if she found that the foot was cold to the touch and Mr. Tolson had no feeling in his foot at that time, would that be something that she would have to write in the chart? No. Objection to the hypothetical. Okay. Why not? Because it's not required documentation. Okay. If you're charting by exception, mm -hmm. is a cold foot something that would qualify as an exception? But I don't see that here. Uh, it's a hypothetical question. It's a hypothetical question. Right. But she's done a neuro assessment, so I don't think the man's got a cold foot. That's not my question. No, yeah. I'll see it again. Okay. If when Nurse Stell mm -hmm. performed her assessment of Mr. Tolson, when she got down to his foot, if she felt his foot and it was cold to the touch, mm -hmm. would that be something that she would be required to note in the chart under the applicable standard of care. Objection asked and answered. You can answer it again. I wouldn't require her to chart that, but I would, I would say she needed to report that to the doctor. Okay. How come it's not required to be put in the chart if she is actually charting by exception as she mm -hmm. says she is? Because she may, not, yes. she may not agree with that. Maybe she doesn't feel his foot's cold. No, I want okay. you to assume. Let me assume go back. it is. Assume no, it. No, yes, no, ma'am. No, okay. Yeah. yeah. Assume that when she got down to his foot, she felt the foot and his mm -hmm. foot would be cold. By charting by exception, wouldn't she then be required to write that in the chart? Objection. Asked and answered. I would give it to the physician. That's what I would do. I would immediately notify the physician. I think that's what the standard of care is for a nurse. Anytime a patient has a cold extremity or starts to complain of a cold extremity, the first thing you're going to do is report it to the physician. Okay. Now, uh, the same question. If when she got down to Mr. Tolson's foot mm -hmm. and touched his foot, mm -hmm. he says, I can't feel you touching my foot. I mm -hmm. have no feeling in my foot. If she's charting by exception, wouldn't she have to note that finding in the chart? Objection. My first thing would be to, rep I mean, I would report it. Just listen to the okay. question, okay? All right. Under the standard of care. Okay. If she's charting by exception, which she says she did in this case, uh -huh. if she followed that format, would she be required to note that finding in the chart? Rodney, I think the problem is you're asking two different questions in your question. No. Did you understand my question? Well, you're asking whether she's a, a let, charted... I want to let ask that the witness understands it. Did you're you asking me if she charted something... And then I don't know what else you're asking me no, in that no, question. Let's go back. We'll, we'll do this. We'll start from the scratch. Do you understand that how Ms. Stell assessed Mr. Tolson's care is that she charts by exception? Yes, sir. Now, charting by exceptions means if you find something abnormal, mm -hmm. it's different from the triage, mm -hmm. she would have written it in the chart, correct? Correct. Okay. Let's go back to the cold foot. If she goes down Mr. Tolson's leg and find the foot's cold, mm -hmm. okay, that's an, an unusual, abnormal finding. Uh -huh. It's not in the triage assessment. Uh -huh. By charting by exception, would she not then be required to note that finding in the chart? Under charting by exception or yes. under standard of care? Charting by exception, okay. which is what she Under does. charting by exception, you would, you would, you would document that. Okay, but, you're you're going to have to yeah, answer okay. the question again because another attorney interjected with an objection while you were answering. Go ahead. Under charting by exception, if I reassessed the patient and found a change in the condition, then I would chart that. And similarly, if she assessed Mr. Tolson and found that he reported he had no feeling in his foot, would she also, by charting by exception with what she does, have to write that in the chart? I would say yes. Now, is the failure to chart those two things, if that's what she found in this case, also a breach of the standard of care. Objection. Go ahead. You can answer. No, because her obligation is to notify the physician with that. Okay. Okay. So, so that it could be reassessed by the doctor. Okay. 
So hypothetically, in this case, if she assessed Mr. Tolson's leg and found his foot was either cold to the touch or Mr. Tolson told her he doesn't have any feeling in his foot, her obligation as a nurse under the standard of care would bring that immediately to the attention of the emergency room physician. Would that be true? That would be one of the things she would do, yes. Would she be required to do that? If she, she needs to reassess that patient herself and document that finding. The patient telling you that doesn't mean that that's, you need to reassess where he's saying he can't feel and where it's cold. Okay. Would she have to tell the doctor if she found his foot was cold to the touch? Would she have to tell the doctor that? There would always be a verbal communication to the physician anytime a patient complains of a cold extremity. And would that be required under the standard of care? Yes. Now, with respect to the numb foot, how would she reassess the numbness? What tests or assessment tests would she be required to do? Just sensation. Okay. And sensation means you put your hand on the patient's foot. And if he says, I can't feel you touching my foot, would the standard of care be, require her to bring that to the immediate attention of the doctor? Objection to immediate, but you can answer. Go ahead. She should bring that to the attention of the physician, yes. Okay. And would that be in a timely fashion? In a timely fashion. Now, if any nurse who walked into Mr. Tolson's room mm -hmm. after Nurse Stell's assessment, mm -hmm. and Mr. Tolson told the nurse there, my foot is cold, and I have no feeling in my foot. Would that nurse under the standard of care be required to reassess his foot at that time? You're going to have to repeat that. Sure. After Nurse Stell assessed Mr. Tolson, okay. Okay, he had some x-rays, correct? Mm -hmm. He was in the hospital for a while, and then he was discharged, mm -hmm. correct? Now. If after she assessed him, another nurse had came in for whatever reason, and he told the nurse, my foot is cold to the touch, and I don't have any feeling in my foot, would the standard of care require that nurse to reassess his foot at that time? Is it a nurse? Yes, ma'am. You're talking an RN? Or LPN. If that was not my patient, I would probably go immediately to the physician and notify the nurse that was caring for that patient. Okay, so if the nurse who walked in, assuming Mr. Tolson told the nurse that, if it wasn't his nurse, but a nurse in the emergency room, then the standard of care would require that nurse to immediately report those findings. Communicate it. To, Let to me finish. Immediately report those findings to the doctor, correct? Again, yes. Again, objection to the term immediate. In a timely manner. In a timely manner. Okay. Now, I could go with that. If it was one of the nurses who was caring for Mr. Tolson, mm -hmm. let's say it was either Nurse Weiss, who would put the IV in his arm, or Nurse Stell. If he had told that to either Nurse Weiss or Nurse Stell, would the standard of care require Nurse Weiss and or Nurse Stell to reassess his foot at that time? No objection. Just asked and answered. No, she did not. Yes, she did. No. She, she answered the question if it was someone other than his nurse. My question is, if it's Nurse Weiss or Nurse Stell, would the standard of care require Nurse Weiss and or Nurse Stell to reassess his foot at that time? Objection, asked and answered. Go ahead. Yes, and notify the physician. Okay. All right. And if either of those two nurses did not do that, would that, and I'm talking about Nurse Weiss and Nurse Stell, mm -hmm. would that be a breach of the standard of care? Objection. Speculative. No foundation. But under your hypothetical. No, because they, they're, they're, their big concern would be reporting that immediately to the physician for, so he can reevaluate. I think that's what I asked. Would it, would it be a breach of the standard of care for those nurses not to have reported it to the physician? Again, you can't give a hypothetical like that without any foundation or basis in fact. So if you want to ask the question specifically with respect to Mr. Tolson rather than just some general thing, then, then perhaps the witness is going to be allowed to answer it. But if you're going to present just a general thing, 
this nurse or that nurse at any time without any other context or any other facts for the hypothetical, then I'm going to actually instruct Ms. Carlson that she should not answer that question even. Actually, I didn't. Man, let me, let me ask her the question again. It's real simple. Did you read Mr. Tolson's deposition where he said a nurse came in and he told the nurse that his foot was cold and he had no feeling in his foot, correct? I believe that's in his deposition, yes. No. If you assume those facts to be true, mm -hmm. under the standard of care, would that nurse, whoever it was, under the standard of care, have the obligation to report that in a timely fashion to Mr. Tolson's physician? Yes. And if that nurse failed to do that, would that be a breach of the standard of care? Objection. You can answer. Yes, I guess so. I mean, well, you can't I mean you're guess. confusing me a little bit on this one. Okay. Um, if the standard of care requires I don't them know to do it, okay. and they don't do it, yeah. would that be a breach? Hold on. Your question was posed initially with respect to Mr. Tolson's deposition testimony. So I think the question is, under that scenario, with Mr. Tolson's testimony in his deposition, whether that was a breach in the standard of care. Let me re-ask the question. I think we already established that if a nurse had came into Mr. Tolson's room and Mr. Tolson told the nurse, as he swore to under oath, his foot was cold and he had no feeling in his foot, then we've established that the standard of nursing care would require that nurse to report that in a timely fashion to Mr. Tolson's physician, correct? Correct. And if they didn't do that, that nurse did not do that, then that would be a breach of the standard of care. Would you agree? Objection. I don't know a nurse that wouldn't do that. So would that be a breach of the standard of care if the nurse failed to do that? I guess you could say it would be. You can't be a guess, ma'am. You okay. can't have guessing well, <laughs> here. It's either, it's yeah. either, it's either if, if. But you're they, giving me if, a hypothetical. Yes, ma'am. Assuming that that's true. Yeah. Would it be a breach of the standard of care for the nurse not to report that to Mr. Tolson's physician? Yes. Okay. Let's just get there. All right. Now, is a nurse who performs an assessment of a patient, such as Mr. Tolson in this case, required to understand what can cause a patient's foot to be cold? Do they have to have that understanding under the, under the standard of care? Repeat that again. Right. In this case, Mr. Tolson reported that his foot was cold to the touch. Uh -huh. If a nurse came in and felt that his foot was cold to the touch, would the nurse have to have some background information and knowledge as to what could possibly cause that condition? Objection to the hypothetical facts, not in evidence, but you can answer. No, not necessarily. They would, you know, he's had an injury to that leg. They would report that to the doctor. Okay. So for reevaluation. Right. So they're not re they're not required to r reach an opinion as no. to what what caused the foot to be cold. No. Or what possible injury caused the foot to be cold, but they have to report that to the doctor. Correct. Okay. Now, would the same thing apply to loss of feeling in the foot? That they don't have to know what causes the loss of feeling in the foot, but they do have to report that to the doctor. Numbness and tingling, which is what Judge, I believe, is in his deposition, then yes, they would if he told them that. And also, we do have a report of numbness and paresthesia which would be tingling from the evaluation of the physician's assistant that is noted in the chart, correct? Correct. Okay. So, well, I guess they were aware of it. Okay. Did you see anywhere in the medical chart where a nurse ever wrote that Mr. Tolson's neurovascular status was intact. By who? Any nurse. Nurse? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Are you asking for the words neurovascular intact? Is that what you're asking? Uh, I asked the nurse if there was anywhere in Mr. Tolson's chart where any nurse ever wrote in his chart that the neurovascular condition was intact by oh. a nurse. 
taking a pulse is, to, is a checking neurovascular. And you can't take a pulse without feeling the skin. You can't take a pulse. If you're taking a pulse on an extremity that's injured, the patient's going to complain of pain. You're going to note right then and there that it's swollen if that's the area that you're taking the pulse in. So, I mean, on her triage assessment, she's certainly got a positive pedal pulse, positive for deformity. Okay, does that, do, do those things mean that his neurovascular status is intact or not intact? Intact. Intact. Mm -hmm. So positive pedal pulse would mean that, that, um, that assessment that she did was intact at that point. So if you have a, uh, a finding by a nurse of a positive pedal pulse, mm -hmm. then that means the neurovascular status is intact. Would you agree with that? And, and yes, I would. Okay. Is there any indication in the chart that Mr. Tolson had any trouble or inability describing what happened to him to any of the medical providers or nurses? Objection. Not that I know of. Okay. Um, for the assessment that Nurse Stell performed, was, and if I asked you this before, mm -hmm. I apologize, was she required to ascertain how he was injured? Objection. Oh my God, ask Go 15 Mechanism times. Mechanism injury, was she required to obtain that or not? She's required to assess his chief complaint. That's really the scope of nursing. Assess the chief complaint. So and what presents him here to the emergency department today. So again, was she required to obtain the mechanism of injury from Mr. Tolson no. when they're still assessed? No. no. What is the obligation of the discharge nurse under the standard of care at the time Mr. Tolson was discharged from the hospital? I'm sorry? What is the... What was the obligation of the discharge nurse? This discharge nurse? Yes. The, di the discharge nurse <laughs> who discharged Mr. Tolson from the hospital. What was her obligation? What was she required to do under the standard of care? Kind of the it goes discharge paperwork. All right. And you're speaking of Caroline okay. Stell. She reassessed his pay at discharge, and that's pretty normal anywhere. She provided him education and instructions, verified his understanding, made sure he had follow-up information and discharge instructions. Any prescription, sick certificate, work certificate, that's all part of discharge. Is that all she was required to do under the standard of care at the time of discharge? It depends on the situation. I'm talking about this situation. This situation? Yes. So what page are you on, Ron? I have trouble finding the page. I'm not on any page. <sighs> Thank you. As far as discharge instructions, prescriptions, patient education, uh, pain reassessment, documenting the fact that he had crutches and knee immobilizer and he understood. There is documentation here that a dressing was applied because the IV was discontinued. Um, I don't see anything else here that she needed to do. Okay. If Mr. Tolson came back from x-ray, and his, and his um, brace was removed, was Nurse Stell or any other nurse required to reassess his leg at that time? Objection to the term beg, but you can answer. Whoever removed the splint usually, which is always a provider, assesses the leg at that time. Nurses don't take off splints, see collars, backboards, it's all done by the doctor. And then they reassess the patient after removal. If the, if Nurse Stell did not do a full assessment of Mr. Tolson's leg because he was in pain and or because his leg was splinted. When his pain level was reduced and the splint came off, would she be required to reassess it or would that fall under the obligation of some other provider? Objection, lack of foundation, no facts to support any of that 
in evidence whatsoever. With that said, you can answer it if you understood. There's too many what ifs. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what you, I, I say it again and I'll try to answer it truthfully, but all these speculations on whether he had a splint on, got back from x-ray. Ask the question again. Yeah, if okay. you could ask it again. If any part of Nistel's assessment was deferred, okay, because he was either in pain mm -hmm. or he had a splint on, mm -hmm. once the pain medication was administered and his mm -hmm. pain level came down and mm -hmm. once the splint was taken off, mm -hmm. Would she be required to reassess him at that okay. time? I am going to object and I'm going to instruct you that you do not need to answer that question. It is up to you, but you do not need to. There is no testimony, no evidence, no suggestion even that any of those things operate in this case or that even Nurse Stell had any requirement under the standards okay. of care for reassessment under that hypothetical, under any hypothetical. So it's your choice. I'd rather not answer that. No, I join the objection. Okay, because I'm not sure I fully understand what I'm answering to. Okay, what about my question, didn't you understand? You've got uh, like three hypotheticals in there. I mean, and I'm not sure what you're asking me. Easy. If Nurse Tell's assessment of Mr. T Tolston could not be fully completed because he was in pain and had a splint on, after his pain level was reduced from pain medication and after his splint was taken off, would the nurse be required to do a full assessment at that time. And again, whether or not you understand his hypothetical is irrelevant to this. Okay. There is no fact in evidence. There is no allegation even okay. that any of these things happened. And therefore, you do not need to answer that question if you choose not to. I'm not and you can simply that, tell him that you're not going to answer that question. I'm not going to answer that question. I'm, I still don't understand That's it. That's fine. That. And you don't have to go beyond that. Okay. Just say you're not going to answer if you choose not to. Okay. okay? Yeah, I'm sorry, so the record's clear. I, I joined the objection. It's entering into Clark King land, and it calls for speculation. Okay. What did you say? It enters into what? Clark King land. What? I don't understand that We still that didn't either. hear it. it. No, no, it just calls for speculation. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Cartoon land. Is oh, cartoon one? land. Oh, okay, I'm glad we got that on the record. Thank you. Okay, now. Is that... I've, are you assuming, ma'am, that when Nurse Stell assessed Mr. Tolson's leg, the brace was off? No. I, okay. I'm not then, assuming anything. Okay. I don't know when they ever took it off. Okay. Then she did a proper assessment with the brace on his leg? Objection. You're setting her up with tricky... No, no. She's I already testified know. that she did a proper assessment. Yeah, she's already wanna... testified it doesn't matter to her opinion whether the brace was on or off. So now you're turning it on its ear and so, saying she did a proper assessment with the brace on? Did, do you know whether or not when Ms. Stell assessed Mr. Tolson's leg, the brace was on his leg or not? I don't know. Does your opinion in one way, shape, or form matter whether the brace was on his leg or the brace was off his leg when she did the assessment? As I said before, no one can tell me how that brace was placed on his leg and whether she was, had accessibility to that area of his leg that needed to be assessed. So without some detailed information regarding the splint, with or without the splint, whether he was clothed or unclothed, I can't really speculate on that or give you an answer because I don't know. Well, I, I believe your opinion is that she followed the standard of care when Nurse Stell mm -hmm. assessed Mr. Tolson's leg. Yes. And your opinion is reached not knowing whether or not the splint was on his leg or off of his leg at the time of the assessment. Is that true? You'll have to repeat that again. You just gave an opinion that Nurse Stell followed the standard of care when she assessed Mr. Tolson's leg, correct? I, are you talking about her documentation? No, her assessment. Is it, is it your opinion? Let me go back. Maybe I misunderstood yeah. you. Is it your opinion in this case that Nurse Stell followed the standard of care when she assessed Mr. Tolson's leg? According to her testimony, she did. Now, and you have reached that opinion without knowing whether or not at the time Nurse Stell assessed Mr. Tolson's leg the splint was on his leg or not on his leg. Would that be true? That's true. I don't know if it was on his leg or off his leg. Okay. All
Ma'am, did you make any notes when you were provided with all the documents, medical chart, and depositions? Not really. Um, let me see if I can. I think I have one little yellow sheet of it for you. Actually, I think you got something there. It's not that. Okay. 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 That might have been yeah, this. No, this is just in the bottom of the Oh, he's got my he's notes. Got the notes. Oh, he's got them. Okay. Let me, I'm Those gonna, are my notes, yes. Okay, I'm going to hand you this yellow Yes, pad. these are my notes. Uh, are those your notes? There you go. Yeah, they uh, were just included a in the file that she had uh, handed can you, can you Because I'm not sure that I can read your writing after the deposition, can you start at the first page and uh, okay. read what you wrote there? And what, if any, significant significance those notes meant to you at the time you wrote them? Actually, read them, and if he has any follow-up questions, okay. then he can ask them. Okay. ED record review. Triage RN, Bessel, RN, vital signs stable, 7 out of 10 pain, no known allergies, positive for pulses. And read slowly okay. for this poor woman. <laughs> positive for deformity, stretcher work, EMS. Page 2, musculoskeletal, cannot assess without undressing. IV inserted, A Weiss, 1527 Delauded IV. Carolyn Steele, 1645 Toradol, A. Weiss. Kayshaw placed knee immobilizer, neurovascular intact, discharge C. Steele, 1725. Triage assessment conducted with eval of leg positive pulse, pain, vital signs, splinted, two plus pulses, pedal. No indication Mr. Tolson complained of cold feet, plus inability to move toes. He received crutches and crutch walking. Mr. Tolson affidavit of 1019, exhibit three, Margison, knee immobilizer. I questioned on his affidavit how he can feel his foot with a knee immobilizer on. Margison deposition on January 13th. I reviewed that. Exhibit 3, Tolson affidavit, dated 1019. I reviewed that. Exhibit 4, affidavit Margison. I reviewed that on 1120. Exhibit 5, expert report on Margison, 115 2012. I reviewed that. And there was something I wrote down that Margison was involved in a Kentucky case for chest pain triage and South Carolina case for IV, something to do with the thumb. Page 18, triage assessment adequate, no change in primary assessment. Vital signs of triage, 101, 67, heart rate 118, respiratory rate 18. Pulse of triage 2 plus. Pulse Shaw, I don't know why I wrote that, neurovascular intact with the after immobilizer. Vital signs done in triage prior to medication. PP versus vital signs. ESI 4 would go to a 3 of triage new nurse, new IV meds, IM meds to be given. That's all in Mrs. Margison's comments, too. Uh, no delay in going to urgent care, 1527, urgent care giving the lauded, 1530, 1645, total ordered given, 1650, 1600. Shaw wrote a note, page 12, DC vital signs, 97, 65, 20, 147 over 97. EMM serve one. I don't know what that means for page two. I'm sorry. I don't know what it means. Then I reviewed Margison's um, January 20th uh, deposition. Then I reviewed Exhibit 15, which was the signature on the EMS report. Two plus normal. That's my note to me that two plus normal is considered in FirstNet, which is what we use for Cerner. Two plus, two plus is considered normal in FirstNet. That's our part, normal practice. Page 210, nurse doing vital signs while Corey Tolson in the room. 
Armstrong. I got out of that one. 12.40, Larson to 2 p.m. I was reviewing his deposition. Wife in attendance, ambulance report time. Triage is not taking a full history of the injury. That's, these are from Dr. Larson's deposition. H&P in the PAMD issue, uh, page 95, provides rotate through rapid medical exam, flex, and something, main. Flex and main, including PA. And I think that's it. Was either the triage nurse or a nurse still under the standard of care required to look at the Maryland Ambulance report that was provided by the paramedics, assuming the report was available and legible at the time Mr. Tolson was in the ER? Again, I'm Which two nurses? Triage nurse, Beshi slash Craddock, mm -hmm. and nurse still. Same objections. There is, this is not an issue in the case. Any nurse can sign off on the EMS report. It becomes part of the record. It's visible for everybody to review. That wasn't my question. My question okay. was, under the standard of nursing care, if the ambulance report was available in the medical chart and legible, mm -hmm. would a reasonable and prudent triage nurse such as Ms. Beshi Craddock and Nurse Stell be required to look at that report? Again, I'm going to object. This is another one of those issues that is not an issue in the case. It's, There's no factual support. Please don't tell support. her what's not an issue in the case. It's you can't not. do that. Yes, I can. No, the you facts can't, that you are putting you in can't. your question are not in evidence. You are creating, you are questioning regarding facts that are not in evidence on issues that are not in evidence with respect to these two nurses, and you are completely discounting other evidence in the chart, which you know about because it's been provided to you in deposition and in answers to interrogatories regarding the nurse who did sign off on the ambulance sheet. So I think it is an inappropriate question the way phrased because you are trying to get this witness to talk about whether or not there's a breach in the standard of care for something that is completely has no basis in fact. Ma'am, you can answer the question. I don't know the question. Answer I'll it. ask it again for the third time. Okay, go ahead. Have you seen exhibit number three? Thank you. Yes, I have. And have you, did you read that before coming to your deposition today? Yes, I did. Now, exhibit number three is a ambulance report prepared by the paramedics who transported Mr. Tolston to St. Agnes Hospital. Would you agree with that? Yes, it's the BS, BLS team that transported him. And you've seen many of these ambulances reports in your, hist in your mm. training yes, experience as a nurse, correct? Uh, correct. Now, if the ambulance report was available, legible, mm. and in Mr. Tolson's chart, would the standard of care under either the triage nurse, Nurse Beshi Craddock, or the nurse who did Mr. Tolson's focus assessment, Stell, require them to take a look and read the ambulance report at the time they did either the triage or the assessment? Objection. Would the standard of care require every single provider involved in the care to read this? Just two. The triage nurse, Beshi Craddock, and Nurse Stell. I can tell you the triage nurse probably got a verbal report from EMS. That's how it's done at the bedside. This report's usually completed once the patient has been transported in and taken over by the staff and unloaded. Yeah, then I mean, they sit down and they do their paperwork. I wanted you to assume yeah. that the report was available in the chart. I'm, I'm not going to assume the written report was available. Ma'am, you, you're going to have to for this hypothetical question. Because you're an expert, I'm entitled to ask you hypothetical okay. questions. Okay. I want you to, and I'll ask the question again. The question is, I want you to assume that the paramedic report was completed, was legible, mm -hmm. and it was in the chart at the time the triage nurse, Bessie Craddock, triaged Mr. Tolson. Under standard of care, uh -huh. would she be required to read the report at that time? Objection. I'm going to object because your expert witness just told you that your excuse, hypothetical... Excuse me, you cannot put a speaking objection on your record while the witness is here. You keep... So, the, so ask questions that have some basis in fact. Ma'am, do you understand the question? Say it again. I'm going to ask now for the fourth time. 
I want you to going to fix the problem. I want you to assume that the ambulance report that is exhibit number three uh -huh. was legible and in the chart uh -huh. at the time the triage nurse performed the triage uh -huh. on Mr. Tolson. Did the standard of care require her to at least look at the report at that time? Objection. Same objection. The standard of care would either need to review the report and get a verbal from the, or get a verbal report from the medics as they brought them in. There's a, conf, there's a verbal exchange with the patient present. Okay. So he can add to if, if there's something the medics forget to tell you. Okay. So, I mean, the, the, you know, and He's the nurse. Answered. Okay. Now, um, the same question with respect to Nurse Stell, who did Mr. Tolson's focus assessment. Uh -huh. Assuming that the ambulance report was legible, was in the, in the chart at the time she did the focus assessment, would the standard of care require her to at least read the chart at that, read Ob the report at that time? Objection. Objection. I'd say no. How come? Because it would be reviewed by, by the time she probably was involved, this has probably already been reviewed by other providers. Okay, so your, opin your opinion is she did not have to review it because you believe that the providers, we're talking about either the physician's assistant or Dr. Jackson had already looked at the ambulance report. Yeah, I didn't need a wife oh, signed yes, it off. Yes. Okay, thank you. So Did she's you? already reviewed it. All right, now. Your certificate of qualified expert indicates that you have the opinion that what the nurses did or didn't do. Well, I'll stick that. Uh, do you intend to offer any opinions as to whether or not the breaches of the standard of care that we claim in this case by the nurses caused or didn't cause Mr. Tolson any injuries in the case? That's called a medical causation question. Do you a medical causation? Of? Yes, ma'am. That'd be something for the medical doctors, wouldn't it? Well, uh, I don't know because I don't know if you intend to offer opinions on that. If you don't, you can tell me you do not intend to offer any opinions one way or the other, whether the alleged breaches caused or didn't cause Mr. Tolson any injury. Repeat that again, that question again. Right. In this case, there's an allegation that the breaches of the standard of care by the nurses resulted in an injury to Mr. Tolson. In your area of expertise, are you going to comment one way or the other whether Mr. Tolson sustained injuries or did not sustain injuries as a result of the claimed breaches of the standard of care? I don't believe Mr. Tolson had any injuries related to the breaches of nursing care. No. The alleged breaches. The alleged breaches of nursing care. No. Okay. Um, what is the injuries that you understand that Mr. Tolson is claiming as a result of the breaches of the standard of care by the nurses? I don't believe the nurses breached any care. Uh, we're talking about the injuries now. And normally, um, the la did you read Nurse Halstead's deposition or know what she testified to? Halstead? Right. No, she has not read it. Nor does she know anything she about it. Okay. Nurse Halstead testified that, that in the field of nursing, it was not proper for nurses to give medical causation opinions on injuries and medical conditions. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you believe that that's a true statement? I'm going to object to the, Nate, the way you phrase that. Well, I simply need to know if this witness is going to tend to give any medical causation opinions. And she says she is, and I'm going to explore that because I don't know if she fully uh, understands what that is. I don't so. think she said she is. I think she said she didn't think that there was a breach, and therefore, and also that she In didn't think care. that there was any injury caused by nursing care because she doesn't think there was any breach. No, I think that's different. Th yeah. th that's two different questions. Okay. okay. I understand well, your let opinion. Me, let me, maybe this will help you. I might be able to help. Okay. Seriously, I know you're looking at me with speculation written you all over helped, your you face. You never helped me before, so <laughs> there, there is reason for that. But go ahead. <laughs> I am not intending to elicit from Nurse Carlson 
um, medical causation testimony, such as such and such of an action or inaction caused this pathophysiologically, this amount of blood flow, anything of that nature. What I am not clear about, um, and I'm telling you this so that you can answer, ask questions if you choose to, is whether she may have opinions that could go to causation based on some of the alleged breaches that you've made in terms of reporting to physicians. I don't think that that goes to medical injury per se. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? No. Okay, well, I, honestly, me, I can do it at the end. I can, I can. Okay. Um, Ms. Carlson, are you aware in this case that Mr. Tolson has claimed that the nurses breached the standard of care and as a result of that, he sustained an injury to his body. Am I aware that he claimed that in his deposition, in his affidavit? Yeah, I'm aware that he did that. Okay. Now, are you aware that we have experts in the case who will address those issues of medical causation and physical injury as a result of breaches of the standard of care? Okay, are yes. Are you aware of that? Yes. Now, in the field of nursing, which you've been offered as an expert uh -huh. opinion, I know you don't believe the nurses breached the standard of care. Uh -huh. Assuming that they did, <laughs> oh, do, you intend, do, do you intend to say, even if they breached the standard of care, you don't believe that it resulted in an injury to Mr. Tolson, or do you intend to say any opinions regarding injuries that he may have sustained as a result of his claimed breaches? Objection. Boy, you got me on that one. <laughs> you got to repeat that again. Do you plan on commenting on whether Mr. Tolson's injuries that he claims in this case were aggravated, worsening, or not aggravated, not worsened, or not caused by any of his breaches of the standard of care that he claims? Objection to form. I didn't even understand that. I didn't understand that at all. Yeah. I just need to know if you're going to give any opinions on medical causation issues. That has to medical do with causation? No. I'm a nurse. I can only give opinions relating to nursing care and the nursing scope of practice. Okay. And you're aware of the breaches of the standard of care that we've claimed in this case that were occasioned by the nurses, correct? Well, yes, but I don't believe there were any breaches of the standard right. of care. If you assume that that happened, that there were breaches, do you then, do you then plan on testifying whether or not those resulted in any injury to Mr. Tolson. Because your lawyer might say, Ms. Carlson, there's been testimony in this case it was a breach by the nurses and those breaches resulted in an injury to Mr. Tolson. Do you believe that, that if there was a breach that he was injured by it? And I need to know if you're going to say, I don't believe he was injured even if we assume there's a breach. Well, then Do you I'm, plan on going down that road? I don't know how she can answer your question because you're now speculating as to something that I may or may not do. And honestly, you don't even have a nurse that says that any alleged breach by the nurses caused an injury. So I don't know how that could happen here. So honestly, I think you've testified to what you know and what you think is going to happen, and I don't think you need to go further than that. Well, then I'm going to move that she not be allowed to testify as to any medical causation issues that include any injuries that may or may have not been caused by the breaches by the nurses because Dr. Larson had indicated that um, discharging Mr. Tolson if his leg was cold and he had no feeling would be a breach of the standard of care and that was approximate cause of his injury. So there is testimony to that effect and now is the only time I have the opportunity to address that with you. So let me ask you, um, if, if Mr. Tolson at the time of his discharge, if when the discharge nurse examined him, he had a cold foot and he had no feeling in his foot, would it be a breach of the standard of care to discharge him home at that time without any further assessment and without bringing that to the attention of the doctor? Objection. That would be communicated to the doctor before discharge by any nurse. And if it wasn't, would that be a breach of the standard of care by that nurse? Yes. Okay. All right. 
And you've read Ms. Margison's deposition testimony? Yes, I did. Okay. And have you provided me with all of the opinions that you've reached with respect to the issues of standard of care in this case? I'm going to object to the breadth of the question. That is awful global. It is. It's meant to be, ma'am. What, what, what that question was meant to ask is if, if you have any other opinions on the standard of care issues that you haven't told me so far, you need to tell me now. And I need to know if you've covered all of the opinions on standard I've of care. I've covered everything. Well, let me put it this way. I've covered all my opinions of what's been asked. Well, I need to know if you have okay. more opinions that I haven't asked you of that you have not yet told me about because this is my only opportunity to find out those opinions. And if I forgot to mm -hmm. ask you a question mm -hmm. and you know you have an opinion on standard of care and you haven't told me that, you need to tell me now. Okay, well, again, I know you're going to shake your head at me, but this is your opportunity to take this nurse's deposition. I wish I could answer it for her because, but you create testimony out of thin air and you create facts that aren't in evidence. Please don't tell me what I created. Ma'am, you you're going to have to step so, outside if the lawyer wants to keep doing this. You my know? point uh, is, Mr. Gaston, that I have no reasonable way to know whether you're going to identify some other breach that my client doesn't know about because you keep creating supposed breaches out of whole cloth that there's no support for in the record. So I don't know how she can do anything more than respond as fully as she has to you. And she has completely tried to answer all of your questions. Well, I'm going to ask you the question again, ma'am. Have you explained to me and told me every opinion that you have reached in this case and intend to give a trial? To the best of your ability. To the best of my ability and what's been asked of me, yes. Well, you can't say to what's been asked of me. What I need to know is, <laughs> sure she can. Have, you ha have you told me all the opinions that you reached in this case that you intend to give a trial? Same objections. I mean, based on what's been asked of me, yes, I have given all the opinions. Are there any opinions that you have that I have not asked you questions about? Mm, not that I can think of at this moment. Okay. And have you told me all of the factual basis for the opinions that you have given here today? Yes. Right. Is there any opinion that you've given that you want to explain in greater detail? No. Okay. All right. That's all the questions I have. And I think no, I we may have you. run out That's of fine. tape. Are you out? Okay. Yeah. This concludes disc one, 5.25 p.m. going off the record.